To go or not to go? That is the question. Have you ever heard of a company called Facebook? I'm sure you have, right? If I were to say to you who was the key founding member of Facebook, which name would you list? Well, if you don't know, the name is Mark Zuckerberg, and even to this day, he's often in the headlines, especially when there's a privacy breach or something like that, right? The, the head man is the guy who, who gets named and maybe even shamed. But did you know that he had a partner? His name was Eduardo Severin. And Eduardo and Mark Zuckerberg eventually over time, although they started off on the same page, they had the same vision, they had the same direction, uh, and they had the same working together, uh, in the end, towards as the partnership grew and as it developed, Eduardo Severin decided he wanted to spend his time in other areas. And so as the story unfolds and as you read about it online, you'll discover that Mark eventually got very upset with Eduardo because Eduardo, he felt, wasn't actually pulling his weight. He was distracted by other things. He wasn't as involved as he should be, at least in Mark's opinion. And therefore, Mark actually reduced his shares in the company. And so there's this parting of ways, this separation of company, and often it comes at the expense of relationship. Not just business, but relationship. You know what? This is exactly what happened with God and Israel. Israel was God's chosen people in the Old Testament. It was his family on earth. He raised them up out of nothing. And in the New Testament, Jesus tells us a story, a parable. In fact, we're going to look at two parables today that kind of lead one into the other and really form one picture. It's towards the end of Jesus' ministry and so we pick the story up in Matthew chapter 21. And so over the years of Jesus being in this world, walking amongst the, the Israelite nation, ministering to them, seeking to reveal that he was the fulfillment of all their hopes and all their expectations and all the promises of the Old Testament, Still, he was meeting with this incredible resistance. They didn't want to receive him. At least the leaders, the leaders of uh, Israel, those who were the decision-making factor of Israel, would not receive him as the Messiah. They, did, they refused to recognize him as the fulfillment of all of the Bible's promises and prophecies. And so, there are, as Jesus nears the end of his ministry, he says more and more things in a clearer and clearer, more blatant way to try and awaken them to the reality that to reject him is to reject the mission or the message which ultimately then causes them to lose their place in God's plan for this world. And that's in essence what's illustrated here in Matthew chapter 21. The first parable is found in verse 28 to, to uh, 32. And here what Jesus says is, a man had two sons, and maybe you can relate to this as a parent. A man had two sons, and he said to his first son, he said, Hey, come, go work today in the vineyard. And the, and the man's son said, I will, sir. But he did not go. And he came to the second and said the same thing, Go work in my vineyard. But he answered and said, I will not. Yet he afterward regretted it and went. The one said yes and didn't go. The other one said, nah, not interested, thank you very much. But in the end changed his mind and went. These two sons represent Israel and the rest of the world, which were called the Gentiles. So God comes to Israel in the Old Testament and he says, I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to call you out of Egypt. I'm going to work miracles in your behalf. I'm going to take you from a small family of people, Abraham and Isaac and so on, right? Through Joseph, I'm going to bless Israel. You're going to multiply there. You'll also go into hard times there, but I will deliver you miraculously. He leads them through the Red Sea. They delay his purposes by by, by their lack of faith. They wander around the wilderness for 40 years. Eventually, they go into the promised land. They take possession of that which God had promised to Abraham hundreds of years before. This is the, the story of raising up the first son by God's grace, by His mercy, by His favor, by His intervention in their behalf. Israel becomes something from a small nucleus, a little family, to becoming a, a, a world empire, if you like. A, a, under Solomon's reign and under David's reign, their borders extended through vast territories. They were the admiration of nations at the peak of their success, all as a result of God's blessing upon them. But God said, those nations that have been dispossessed so that you could have the promised land, those nations, they failed their covenant agreement. They, they, they committed idolatry. They committed the worst of crimes against humanity, child sacrifice and the like. I'm removing them for just cause. I'm putting you in their place. But know this, Israel, know this. 
if you worship their gods, and if you do as they did, I will remove you from the promised land. That leads us to the story of the exile where Babylon comes and takes Israel out of the promised land for 70 years, a great divine time out, if you like. Eventually they come back into the promised land and after many, many, many years of prophets and of messengers and of teachers and of preachers being sent to them, sometimes they yielded their hearts, other times they didn't. The seesaw up and down roller coaster journey of spirituality and of national uh, prosperity, those two always linked together. Eventually Jesus comes into this world and Jesus says to them, here I am, all your hopes all of prophecy pointed forward to this time. Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. Actually, life comes from me. They, the scriptures, are that which testify about me. This book, the Bible, the Old Testament for the Jews, Old and New Testament for Christians, is not where life is in and of itself. It's not a magic charm. No, this book, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brought to life as you read it by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, leads you to the person of Jesus Christ. And in Him is eternal life. This is the road map. This is the way we find Jesus. This is the revelation of God and His character. And the Holy Spirit brings us alive so that you and I today, through the power of the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, come to know and love, enter into conversation, commitment, covenant with God as Israel. Israel did in the very beginning. So Israel is the first son in this parable. They were called, they responded, they were only too happy, they said they would go, they would be the light of the world. God centered their nation at the very, in the very middle of all the trade routes that went from Western Europe to Northern Africa and out to the Asian continent. They were right there in the center and, and as people passed through their borders for commerce, for business, for travel, God did that so that the, all those nations passing through would see a difference would see the results of a group of people in covenant with the true God, living in a different way, exhibiting a different character, uh, being obedient to the true law of God, His Ten Commandments, and the prosperity that that would bring. And thus, through this living example, just as much as through the, 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 you know, the speaking, the telling the story, the explanation, life and words combined together, giving credibility and power and explanation for this phenomenon of transformation and of difference between the Israelite nation and all other nations, these people would, would learn the lesson, they would take it back to where they come from, and the whole world would be evangelized. Israel said, that sounds like a deal. We will do that. We will go for you. And then they didn't. They adopted the customs of the people around them. They turned to the false gods. They betrayed the God of the covenant. God in His mercy reached out to them in their stubborn heartedness and their, and their hard heartedness. They would not receive Him. Now Jesus is amongst them, right? Now Jesus is saying, I am the hope of Israel, the hope, the desire of the ages. I am here. And still they are stubbornly refusing Him. So Jesus says, there's a second son. And the second son is a prefigurement in Jesus' time looking forward to the establishment of the church, a group of people that would enter into covenant with Him, not bound by national identity, not bound by the, by the bloodlines of Israel. Anybody and everybody who would receive Jesus Christ as their Savior would become the church of God, the people of God, spiritual Israel according to the New Testament teachings. This was the son, initially the Gentile nations, who were supposed to be won over through the example and the teaching uh, of Israel. These Gentile nations who initially said, we don't want anything to do with you, we'll do it our way. This is the son who said, I'm not going, I'm not interested, get away from me, I'm doing my own thing today. But then he changes his mind. And it ends up that the, that the group of people, the Gentile nations, that, that didn't want anything to do with God initially, would ultimately be the ones that would receive the covenant and its promises and become the people of God sent with a mission because they accepted the person of Jesus and therefore accepted a message. And mission is always born out of message. If you reject the message, you have no mission. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you've got nothing to offer, then you've got nothing to offer. And so this is the story that Jesus is telling him. He's saying to them, you know what? A time is coming 
where you will no longer be the favored people of God. You will no longer be the celebrated uh, people of God, the covenant people of God. Uh, Why? Because you have rejected the message and the central pillar of the message, Jesus Christ. And another will go in your place. Jesus says to them here in verse 31, Truly I say to you that the tax gatherers and the harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you. John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax gatherers and the harlots did believe him, and you seeing this did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. You see, what God is looking for is the response of faith that manifests itself in willing, chosen obedience the service of love. I, I want to highlight in the teaching of this parable and the next one today that faith that is merely lip service is not genuine faith, is not saving faith. Faith that is the experience, the, 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 the response of love to a God who has first loved us always will manifest itself in willing obedience, a transformation of life, a turning from the, 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 uh, the acts and the lifestyle of rebellion, a turning towards a lifestyle of submission, of surrender, and of obedience going forward. We were once at war with God and His principles, thinking that they were not the path to happiness, they were not the path to life, but now we realize that they were, that they are. No, I'm not talking about external forms of religion or going to church because we think that it merits our favor with God or that we can do some great thing that will make God turn on the happiness tap because we, you know, we've impressed him and therefore we earn his blessings. It's not like that. It's that genuine friendship. It is that entering into covenant with God. It is that realizing that he's got my back and I just want to honor that fact by being faithful to him. It's genuine besties type friendship that brings contentment and peace and makes all those other things we clamor for in life kind of disappear into insignificance. But here's what I've found as I've journeyed with God. The thing of it is that His commandments and His requirements are not designed to be a burden to us. They're not designed to stop us from enjoying life. They're actually a hedge of protection, a barrier that keeps us on the road and stops us from crashing off down the cliff. It's, it's that hedge of protection that, that says, I love you, my child, and this is the way life is meant to work. This is the way you were designed. If you live in accordance with the great designer's plan for your life, for your body, you will reap in your life and in your body the best possible results. Now I recognize, I recognize that we live in a world of sin. And so there, is, there are these competing forces at war that, don't, that, that, that often skew the results. And we sometimes think, yes, but I did this and I did that and I followed what you said and still this has happened in my life and that's happened in my life and I'm still not, you know, why, why am I sick? Why am I this? Why am I that? The reality is we live in a war zone. But your best hope and your best opportunity of reaping the best life is to live in harmony with the best guidelines of the designer for life, for your body, and for your happiness, and for your relationships. The reason God has laws and requirements, it is not about restricting your freedom. It is about guaranteeing your long-term sustainable joy, happiness, contentment, peace, and all that great stuff. He says, this is how it was meant to work. Now, you can choose not to live in harmony with that. Sure, go ahead and do it. Invent your own plan. But it is the pathway to death. I mean, that's kind of why Proverbs says, right? That's why Proverbs says there is a way that seems right to a man. It makes sense. I mean, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's forget about what the Lord said. This is where happiness is. Look at those people. They look smiling and happy and whatever. You know why that is? Because they're in the early stages of Satan's advertising campaign. They're not yet reaping in their bodies and in their lives and in their relationships the brokenness that that, that inevitably results from living outside of God's plan. And the reality is that when you, when you choose that broken path that seemed right to you in the beginning, eventually you will reap the consequences of it. 
So here Jesus is saying two sons. One says yes, the other says no. The one who said yes ends up not going. The one who says no ends up going, depicting the future faithfulness of the Gentiles who would turn towards him and become his emissaries, his messengers of mercy. Why? Because you can only have a mission when you have a message. The Jews would reject it and the Gentiles would accept it and thus would be born this thing that we call the church of God today. Now, we go on to another parable here. Verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one, killed the other, stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard, killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Before we look at the answer to that, this is the story of Israel that I've basically recounted. If the first parable illustrates the call to obedience, the call to faithfulness, this second parable highlights the reason why God is calling for obedience. And it's this idea that before God calls you to holiness, to righteousness, to obedience, to good doing, He first extends His kindness to you. Why should those two sons have been faithful? Because God had been faithful to them. This picture of the vineyard, it is the story of the kingdom of God. This idea that they were called to tend the vineyard is the way in which God employs us in His service and employed at first the Israelites in the service of God. He said, come, I want you to take care of my vineyard. I want you to grow my kingdom. I want you to tend it. I want you to take care of the people who make up my vineyard. And remember in John chapter 15 how Jesus says that He is the true vine, we are the branches. And in the center of this vineyard is a tall tower, it says. That tower in Old Testament times was in essence the sanctuary of Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem as the capital city in the later times of Israel was also where God established the center of worship. And the center of worship centered around what? Around the temple. Because at the temple you had the priests, a symbol of Jesus. They were types or symbols of Jesus. And you had sacrifices which were types and symbols of Jesus. And you had services that unfold that explained the, 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 the plan of salvation. The sinners would bring their lambs. They would confess their sin over the head, indicating this idea of substitution, the way in which somebody else stands in my place. I transfer my guilt through confession onto this animal. Or if we were talking about the reality of salvation, through, I, through my confession, of sin, I transfer my guilt upon Jesus, right? That's why in 1 John 1 verse 9 it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Through, through that Old Testament illustration using animal sacrifices and an earthly priesthood and a physical location was illustrated the very throne room of God, the dynamic of salvation and the centrality and the faithfulness of Jesus in fulfilling every requirement of salvation. The only thing that rested upon us was to receive it and this was symbolized by the way in which you confessed your sin over that little animal sacrifice, right? And then once a year in that sanctuary service, uh, as sin had been transferred into the sanctuary day by day through the confession of sin, symbolically it defiled the sanctuary. And then once a year, a cleansing of the sanctuary took place. And at the close of that service, Israel was symbolically regarded as sinless and faultless before God. They stood there for that brief moment, and it was only a brief moment because, of, because the reality is that that earthly system didn't do anything at all in terms of the reality of salvation. It was all simply symbolic. But for that brief moment of time at the end of this service, Israel stood there without fault, without blemish before God, symbolizing you and I one day, as Revelation says, standing on that sea of glass before the Lamb of God slain since the foundation of the world, that because of His merits and because of His salvation, you and I are not going to heaven as sinners with a black mark against our name. We are going as those who have never sinned. I think that's just a wonderful and a glorious idea, an incredible offer that's given to us. 
But coming back to our story, in the center here of this vineyard is the sanctuary service pointing to the centrality of Jesus. And Jesus is amongst them and they are rejecting him, which means they are rejecting the very meaning of their ceremonies and their sacrifices and their systems, which they are so proudly clinging to. Isn't that an irony? How religion can get in the way of salvation? How religion can get in the way of relationship with Jesus Christ? Now that doesn't make religion a bad thing in and of itself. It calls us to be aware of the way in which our sinful, prideful hearts can become narrow-minded, can, can produce myopia, you know, a short-sightedness on our part, so that we are not seeing beyond the symbols and the rituals, but, but instead we are fixated on them. The means to the end becomes the end in and of itself. This was the trouble for Judaism. This was the trouble for the Jewish nation. And we have to be aware of the, as the church of God, the family of God on earth today, that that doesn't become the problem for us. So that we are fixated on doctrine and we are fixated on this thing and we're fixated on ritual and we're fixated on all sorts of things that we think are so essential to the church experience. And we miss out that at the most fundamental level, all of those things are only supposed to facilitate and point our minds heavenwards towards Jesus. Do not let religion get in the way of your experience with Jesus. Now, coming back to the story again. It says here that they dug, uh, it's described here, Jesus describes here his kindness to the vineyard and to those who occupy it. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And all he wanted in return is their faithful service, their devotion to mission, all the blessings he had provided, all the resources he had invested. It's a picture of the grace of God, a picture of the kindness of God and the call that we would simply respond to his grace by faith with willing, active service. The service of mission and the service of obedience. They were to follow the instructions. That's obedience, right? They were to follow the instructions of the landowner. And they were to invest their energy in serving the landowner and the community around when the harvest time came. So there are two elements to this obedience, I believe here. The first element is obedience to the commandment of the landowner. And the second is obedience to the calling of mission to serve. And you're right. Those two things sound very similar and they're very closely related. Because when we are obedient to God and we do follow his instructions, we are also serving one another. I mean, think about it. Think about the Ten Commandments. And I'm just going to pick for a moment on the last six, which describe our relationship with other people, right? You think about how parents serve the children, children serve the parents, and this beautiful family dynamic is preserved by the Fifth Commandment. You think about the commandment not to steal, not to uh, lie, not to cheat, right? And you think about how that blesses and serves the community around you, encourages the growth of trust and healthy relationships. You think about the marriage context and how the seventh commandment tells us to be faithful to our spouse, husbands and wives, how that blesses the family circle, how, how healthy family dynamics are a blessing and a service to the larger community because out of healthy families come healthy society members, right? As we love one another in marriage, we serve our children, we serve one another, we raise the next generation that is best able to go out into society and be a blessing. You see, whenever you are obedient to God, obeying his commandments, you are also serving not only God, but also humanity. All of God's commandments are about the preserving and the sanctity of relationships. They are not arbitrary checklist behaviors. And if you've seen them that way, then you have not seen them clearly and you have not seen them deep enough. All of God's callings are for the blessing of people, for the saving and the, and the flourishing of relationships. So it blows my mind this day, it blows my mind that in our world today, even amongst Christian followers who claim to be living in covenant with God, there is this heinous counterfeit teaching that the commandments of God are done away with by the cross of Jesus. May it never be. It can never be because those relationships are all, or those commandments are all about relationship with God and with man. The first four cover what he expects of us in response to his kindness, right? That we honor his name, that we have no other gods before us, that we 
that we do not create graven images and bow down to them, that we, that we speak His name with reverence, and of course, that we respect that seventh day Sabbath, that holy time where He calls us to lay aside all the cares of the world, all the busyness and all the craziness of the world, and for one day, empty that space, of, of, uh, that t- that space and time of, of those activities that clutter the rest of our lives, so that we can enter into covenant relationship and experience with Him. Be refreshed in His presence. Come aside. It's like date night with God. The first four commandments are all about our relationship with God. The last six commandments are all about our relationship with mankind. And yet many people, perhaps their desire really is to get rid of the fourth commandment, but they misinterpret the teachings of Scripture to suggest to us that we no longer need to keep the commandments of God because we're not under law but under grace. Now listen to me, we aren't under law and we are under grace, but the grace of God leads us to repentance. And what are we repenting of? The lawless, broken, uh, relationship abusing lifestyle of our past. If the goodness and the kindness of God leads us to repentance, repentance from sin, which is defined in 1 John 3 verse 4 as the transgression of the law, the Ten Commandments, then guess what? God is calling us in our covenant walk with Him to be faithful in obedience to His commandments. He's asking us to live outwardly away from ourselves with regard to other people to take care of them. As Philippians chapter 2, I think it's verse 3 says, Do not look out only for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. This is the Christian life. This is the outward focus. And this is where the Jews had failed. The Israelites had failed. All the blessings of God, all this kindness of God, all the investment that he made in this vineyard, they appropriated for themselves. They killed the prophets who came to them. They killed Jesus Christ, the son of the king who came to them. They crucified him, right? They're they're standing before Pilate where Pilate washes his hands and they say, may his blood be upon us. We choose Barabbas over Jesus. That act was a statement of severing the covenant with heaven, breaking the covenant with God. And out of that eventually came the setting aside of Judaism as God's chosen people, his missionaries to the world, and the establishment of the Gentile church, to which any any Jewish-blooded person may also become joined and accept the covenant of grace by grace through faith, right? Any Jewish person can now join the Gentile church and become a partaker again in the mission to the world. But today we live in an age where we do well to learn from the mistakes of our predecessors, the Israelite nation. Are we so busy appropriating the blessings God pours out upon us, upon our families, upon our land, upon our church, so busy using it for our own purposes and our own comfort that we've lost sight on the selfless call to serve, to invest in the world around us? In other words, We live selfishly with regard to our own ease. We do not live sacrificially. We do not pour ourselves into the life of others. We do not inconvenience ourselves. If that is us, then we do well to heed the call to repentance that Jesus gave to the Israelite nation. If it is us who say we don't need to pay attention to obedience to God's commandments and to His law, we do well to heed the warning given to the Israelite nation. God calls us to the highest standard of righteousness. I'm not saying that you and I attain to that in our daily experience. We are compelled to live by grace through faith. But the standard has not been lowered. It is still the high and holy standard of God's moral Ten Commandment law. And in that standard, we see the deficiency of our character. We're called outside of ourselves to dependence upon Jesus Christ. And then a step further, We go outside of our comfort zones to become God's emissaries, His voice of message and of mercy to the world. We invest in the world around us the way Jesus left heaven above, the way He came into this world. So too, you and I are called to do the same. So Jesus asked that question to the Jewish people. What will happen, do you think, when they kill the son of the king? They said to Him, We will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. And as they were caught up in the story and as they gave that answer without realizing what they were saying, they in essence condemned themselves. So I ask you, do we rely on the favor of God blindly? Do we have regard to the covenant 
of God? Are we fulfilling our side by responding to God's grace with a spirit of faithfulness? Are we willing to walk in the footsteps of the master and lay down our life of ease and comfort to sacrifice for the lost, to bring the message of the kingdom to them? Are we obedient to God and his commandments, living the life of repentance, the confessing of our sin? And lest we share in that judgment that came upon Israel for unfaithfulness, then it behooves us to take the warning seriously and to commit and re recommit, if you like, our lives to this covenant invitation, to enter into this relationship and this lifestyle and this calling and this service, to lose ourselves in the kingdom of God, for that kingdom is at hand. It is coming soon. And at the center of that kingdom is none other than what Jesus said here to the Jewish people. Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. You see, Jesus says he is the king of the kingdom. He is the one that has called us into covenant with him. What a glorious idea that God has given us all the riches of heaven already. And he simply asks that we would allow him into our hearts so that he would change, so that he would transform, so that he would renew our hearts to the extent that we would become like him in character. Israel was planted where it was geographically to be a messenger to the world. The church of God today has been diffused throughout all nations of the world, but the calling, the job, the mission is the same. You and I are called to represent the king of the kingdom, not only in our teaching, our words, our claims, our quoting and telling of the story, but with our lives, with our lives that give credibility to the message. You see, when you live the life of the kingdom and then you speak of the kingdom, people sit up and take notice for they have seen something different. And when they see the power of God working in you and through you, they're more likely to hear the words that you speak to them, the calling that you have for them. Our lives give credibility to the witness of our words. Israel had a great system which they did not allow to transform their heart. You and I have the fulfillment of the promises of that system, the living, walking, talking, heavenly ministering Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb who laid down his life for our redemption. We have the reality of those promises today. They are yours for the taking as you enter into a faith commitment, receiving the salvation of God. And then as that touches and changes your heart, your calling, having been born into the kingdom, is that you go as a missionary in behalf of the kingdom to live the glorious life that the kingdom promises, to live down here in this world, the life of the future kingdom, to bring that future kingdom in time forward to, your, to our time right now by living it, by proclaiming it, by demonstrating it to a world that is hungry and thirsty for something different and is looking for it. Will they see it in you? Will they see it in me? By God's grace, let's ask him right now that that would be fulfilled. Heavenly Father, today we bow our heads and our hearts and we acknowledge that we we are still tainted by the corruption of selfishness. We still live for our own pleasure and there are times we still indulge disobedience and rebellion. We need your grace and we need your forgiveness. And having received this, Lord, we ask that you would do your work in our heart that would change us and would transform us, that would cause the world around us to see with their own eyes something different and realize that there is genuine power in the story of the crucified, resurrected Jesus Christ and His kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen.